Good evening all. Uh, welcome to the Roja Muthya Library for uh, Madras Week Lecture. May I request uh, Mr. Kombe S. Anwar, uh, Good evening all. documentary uh, filmmaker, Welcome to the Roja Muthya Library for uh, uh, to introduce Madras Week Lecture. Introduce today's speakers and uh, say a few words uh, about Roja Mr. Muthya. Mr. Kombe S. Anwar, uh, Good evening all. Documentary uh, filmmaker. Welcome to the Roja Muthya Library for uh, to introduce Madras Week Lecture. Introduce today's speakers and uh, say a few words about Roja Muthya. Mr. Kombe S. Week or Madras Month Lecture at RMRL. And uh, just a few words about RMRL for those who are coming for the first time. Um, <clears throat> This was a collection of a private individual, Roja Mutaya, and uh, about one lakh of uh, documents, manuscripts, old publications, Tamil publications, were taken after his death. And uh, with the University of Chicago and all that was put for public use. And from that, it has grown into almost five lakh documents today. And old manuscripts are available. Uh, they have gone about expanding it in many ways. Uh, so you have the Indus Center, which also does great research and policy foundation. And for any place, any society, you know, you need these think tanks and policy foundation. I'm happy that Roja Muthaya Research Library is evolving into that. And uh, please, you know, scholars, you know, use this extensively. Many scholars have benefited from it. And uh, one of that is actually sitting here, Bhavani. Bhavani has done it extensively. And we are happy to be presenting her. Uh, talk and she has been at this for a long time, almost a decade, I think, now working on these topics and something fabulous on the maps of Madras, also, which I'm sure you know, one day that will also come out. And uh, Kuvam, you know, when I came to Madras first, uh, that was in 1984 to study in Loyola. And I remember, you know, morning jogging when I went into College Road, when I went by Kuvam, it stank. I couldn't bear the stink, it was so bad. But now I'm so used to it. You know, we, I don't even recognize the stink. You know, become part of it. That is the kind of thing that you know, we all get used to. But it was not always like that. But I assume that at one point of time it was a river. But what Bhavani says, interestingly, you know, this was made into a river, if I'm right, in 19th century. And uh, so that was a surprise to me. Uh, but a lot of these settlements, you know, we all have heard stories of Kuva, of uh, Pachepa Madalia taking his bath, now of Arkad taking his, you know, building his palace and having his bathing pavilion right next to Kovo. And Kovo where it meets the sea. That is where Nawab of Arkad's bathing pavilion, that is what is today University of Madras. So that is what Kovo was once. And a lot of Nawab of Arkad's properties used to be around the Kovo. 
no on the southern bank of kuwa but today you know we think of kuwa only as a sewerage so it has had its various histories and we did have you know i remember karnanidhi during dmk's time karnanidhi in the 70s you know, trying to restore kuwa padaguture if you go even you find remnants of it today but i understand that is not the only time that the restoration was attempted there are many other times now there's a lot that to be shared and uh, i'm sure bhavani and uh, aditya are going to uh, talk about it both are accomplished scholars uh, and i give the mic to them i'll not stand between them. thank you the lights off yeah i've asked for the lights off so that you can see the screen better my name is bhavani um i'm a historian and i've spent many years in the tamil nadu state archives doing research in egmore opposite egmore station can you hear me yeah little more okay So my name is Bhavani. I've spent a lot of time doing research in the Tamil Nadu uh, State Archives and visiting Chennai over two decades now. My colleague Aditya Ramesh is an environmental historian who's writing a fabulous book on the engineered history of Kaveri. And uh, the two of us are, I think, in a kind of midway point with this project on the Kuwam. And since everybody here. looks young we are going to treat it as a open kind of project a project that is opening out the stories of kuwam allowing you all to ask questions of the kuwam and of the city's history but let me explain why i i want to say a little bit as to why i ended up uh, doing this with aditya so in 2015 when the floods came i think i like a number of people had a bit of a wake up call about the geography of the city everything that i had known as land turned into water everything that had once uh, been a building had turned into a lake um so it was a very um i think emotional moment for i think all of us um, certainly myself even though at that point i was in toronto and i flew into chennai the week after the waters receded and i remember walking down looking around my neighborhood and asking you know talking to people people i had known for many years and it was very striking to me that so much of the guardianship of the city in that moment of crisis had been taken up by of course community volunteers the people of chennai but also so many people who worked on the streets of chennai uh, in our local neighborhood one of the reasons why my parents street didn't flood was because our local auto stand people knew exactly where to break the culvert and to drain the water into the adyar there were many many stories like that we heard stories of rescue we heard stories of action workers who worked beyond the call of duty to bring the city back into some kind of working order so that memory of kind of the ghosts of water that came back having been banished by urban development came back to haunt us as well as that sense of the people the working people of chennai really knowing the gradient of the city and knowing the land um as opposed to say middle class residents was very very enlightening for me and that took me to maps and i began to think about maps and i think aditya will share do you want to say something about why you got into this aditya okay when when aditya talks he'll he'll tell you a little bit about how he got there these personal stories in a way are important i think because none of us are neutral observers or objectifiers of history we all come into something because of a passion or because something happened or because we are trying to work out something or because we have a question about something that doesn't seem right and uh, for me sort of bringing that to the foreground allows us to sort of i think also explain the two of us that this is a partial history you know can you say can you actually write a definitive history of the kuwam i don't think so because in a way you have to write a definite you can't write a definitive history of the chennai as a city but more importantly i don't think you can write a definitive history of all our singular and collective imaginations so you have to see what i'm sharing on behalf of the two of us as a beginning okay before i start on the formal presentation i want to say something else which is about maps maps are very interesting historical artifacts and i'm going to show you we're both going to show you 
some historical maps that we have collected and scanned um, actually so much with the help of the RML library and the RML staff here um, who helped us so much to get some of these materials together. Um, and when you see these maps, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon of seeing the place that you know very well represented as an old map. It's a, you feel a like sort of sense of shock, perhaps. Uh, when you go on your bus or on your moped or on your car or whatever, next time when you cross Napier Bridge, I'm sure it's going to look a little different because of the map that you've seen. But maps are also, I think, texts of power. Each map is selective. It lies in that sense. It doesn't present a whole picture. So you have to think a lot about you know, what makes maps work. What are they showing? What are they hiding? What do they show without necessarily talking about it, which might kind of even pass by the attention of the map maker that you might find as a scholar or as an interested member of the public. And most of all, maps, because they are not transparent pieces into the past, have to be matched with other things. So in this talk, we've tried to match them with images, with texts we found in the archives in order to present a kind of a history of this water body that we know as the Kuhn. Okay, so now I'm going to go through the presentation. I don't think it's a very long presentation. We tried to keep it short. And uh, we did so in the hopes that you will be able to engage with it and ask questions. Okay. So let me begin with this very typical Wikipedia style, Wiki common style image of the Kuhn. Let's read this image together. What do you see? Do I, can I have any, anybody just saying what they see? What are, the, what are the landmarks? Can you guess where this is from? Yes, you see the TV tower. What else can you see? Yes, what else can you see? You can see the spires of the Madras University. You can see uh, the MRTS rail link on the right side. What else can you see? Look at the banks of the Kuwam. Yeah. It's clean. What did you say? Kind of clean, kind of still, okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you see, so you see embankments, and on the right side, you see, you see the depth. You see remains of some kind of life that had existed there, right? And in some ways, this image of the Kuam is what you see today when you wander around Chennai. You see uh, a project to try and make it clean, to try and make it look like a river. And I want to sort of talk about how we came to this. Why do we find ourselves in this point? So why is history important? In a way, a lot of the city's myriad, myriad narratives about the Kuam engage with its death. Um, death by the city, death because its waters were diverted, um, and then plans to revive. And as Ambar, uh, Anwar mentioned just now, the most important one was of Kalenir uh, in 1969-70. That's the one that is discussed a lot uh, today. And in fact, today, the image that I'm sharing with you came out of the Hindu paper this morning, um, which also brought up the uh, Paranthore and the uh, success of the, of, the, of the government in actually making the river flow for a few years before the strand, sand dredgers gave up. So we have the story of the death of the city, death of the Kuang, which in a way actually calibrates the health of our city in a way. And the various, various histories of its revival. But what if I told you that this river, this water body, is actually part of a broader Coromandel ecology, which is highly seasonal, and this water body is both highly seasonal, that is, it dries 
completely in moments of time. It floods heavily in times of rain. And it might even be seen as two distinct types of water. One is more inland, the water channel that connects all the Aries and the Kulams that feed into it. And the intertidal space that we recognize as the urban core, which is the space that we see near uh, Chipak Palace, that we see near Madras University, that we see near Chindadri Pet Station, um, which is a part of the river that is completely connected to the sea. So you have to think of it in some ways as two, as a, as a, as a, as a water body that connects two distinct types of water, two distinct types of types of water landscapes. Okay. So in some ways, what we want to sort of think about in this talk is what would it mean to think about not river restoration, but river making? So we look at this kind of failure, various failures to make the koam flow as actually a way of making the koam into a river. And that raises lots of interesting questions. There are technological questions. There are engineering questions. There are also questions of the imagination. What do we expect from a river? What does a normal river look like? What does a global urban city with a river look like? These are all questions that come to our mind when we start looking at these different restoration projects. So in what follows, one of the things that Aditya and I want to share is our sense that the Kuam actually becomes understood in the imagination of the city as a river, as the city develops. So in some ways, what we're saying is that these two images concerning the Kuam, one of revival and one of death, are actually co-produced. They're produced at the same time. We might think of them as contradictory or conflicting images or conflicting imaginations, but they are actually connected. And in the rest of the talk, we're going to try and ask about how they came to be connected. One of the implications of bringing about this relation between these two images, rather than saying, oh, there's this terrible death of the river that we're now reviving, is to suggest that actually in between these two images is a third history, which is that of the urban histories of the Quran. And we may not be able to do justice to this third history. Um, and we hope perhaps that many of you here might have some histories to share, some third histories. But um, we'll see where we go with, in terms of time. Okay. So in this particular lecture, what we thought would be, I think, useful for everyone and what we would like to share is our research into maps that got us to think about the Kuam in this way, as a kind of site for understanding how cities make rivers. Um, and so I wanted to just show you how a typical map in an archive looks like. It usually looks like this. This is a very old 18th century map. Um, and you can see it's a fold out map. Um, maps are either rolled up or increasingly they're kind of folded into eighths or tenths. So when they are pulled out, you can see them in sections. Um, if they are preserved well, you'll see them like this, but sometimes they are not. So you'll have to actually put the sections together and look at them uh, to make sense of, of, of what they're depicting. This map is a hand-drawn map. And it's a map that was made um, originally from a hand-drawn map, and then it was printed up. It's a very um, famous map of the plan of the Fort St. George from 1756. And I'm going to zoom in to one aspect of this map, which is the mouth of the Kuam. And you can see here what's interesting about the map. And Aditya and I talked a lot about this. And we were like, OK, there are many things we can tell you about this map. But the one thing that we would direct your attention to is notice how the Kuam does not actually meet the sea. Notice how there's a sandbar across it. Notice how this area that we now know so well as the island ground, that was the image from where we, I showed you uh, the second slide. Notice how A, it's uninhabited, which we don't know whether it was inhabited or not, but certainly there were no government buildings on it. But also notice how there were rivulets and channels cutting around it. Okay. And then look at all the different islands and small um, pieces of land 
that then pepper that channel. Okay, on the right side um, here, oops, sorry. This is the fort, and here you can see um, Fort St. George, I mean the uh, Georgetown, the left hand, uh, the left western parts, southern parts of Georgetown. Okay. This is a map from um, 1798. Okay, so several uh, decades, centuries later. This was a map, um, and Anwar, you might be interested in this map. It was made by Alexander Ross. Um, it's a map that actually H.D. Love describes. And it's a map that tells you about the growing kind of property relations in the city. Um, so the western part of the map, that is actually the southern part, this part, this part, is all actually under the Nawab of Arkot, right? So he had a separate jurisdiction. He was exempted from the jurisdiction of the British. So he had complete control over the banks of the Kuwam at that point. But Chindadri Pet and the northern banks of the Kuwam, as far as I know, were under the company, at least according to this map. Now, the interesting thing about this map, you can see, is it's looking a little unmade, right? It doesn't have a very distinct distinction between land and water. Now, partly this is because of the uh, technique of the map. It was handmade, hand-drawn, and hand-painted. So in these kinds of maps, you see the kind of fluidity of land and water that we kind of know from walking on the beach or standing on the banks of a river. You know, there is that point where you walk and you don't quite know whether you're standing on land or in water. These kinds of maps uh, capture that very well. And to my mind, when Aditya and I were talking about it, we decided to show uh, this map because it suggests to us that till about 1800, there was an acknowledgement that the Kuam was something that was in flux, that had not a very distinct land water boundary. Okay. This is a map from 20 years after 1822. Same institution, the Madras uh, Supreme Court, um, same problem, what's the jurisdiction of the court? But look at the difference. This is a map where the property markers are very, very clearly marked. Um, you see the sea is now fully connected to the Kuam. You see very distinct bridges. You see um, a lot of neighborhoods in the city. Um, you see that the uh, island has been embanked. Um, and you see, in a way, the idea of the river emerging. This is the river, right? It's supposed to be free flow, free, freely flowing and properly behaved. And of course, the Kuam bucks all that, right? That's why we're where we are today. Now, I wanted to also show you this painting from 1803. Um, this is an image from the British Library site. Uh, you could, it's online. Uh, you should go there. They have a lot of fantastic materials on Chennai. And what's interesting about this um, image to us uh, when we were sort of doing the research was that in all these, um, in a lot of these old landscape paintings of Chennai, especially this one, which is um, uh, of the Kuam, you will see in the foreground an acknowledgement of its swampiness, right? This is something that, you know, we sort of know but we see it as a kind of an impediment on the flowing river, which is a river of our imagination. But in fact, when you look at this image, you can see that the bridge was basically built over a seasonal water body. And parts of that water body do shade into uh, a swamp. Now, in some ways, what's interesting to us is that you can take this image um, to say, okay, Madras was a watery city. You can even take this image to mean, oh, here's an old artifact about Madras, the Venice of the East. You can you know, talk about it that way. But what was interesting to us looking at it was really this acknowledgement of what kind of water. This is not necessarily a kind of flowing river water. 
at this time, um, to give you a little bit of context, this is an image from 1810 or so, 1803 or so. At this time, um, the East India Company was embarking on breaking the bar, the sandbar between the river and the sea. The image on the right is from an engineering, uh, is a correspondence about talking about the re-engineering of the Coom. And here what you see, this is from 1836, so early 19th century, is that the East India Company is very invested in creating the Coom as a river, but also linking it to various other um, um, other water bodies in the region as a sort of um, interlinked project. Okay, so this is happening around 1836-37. Now you might think of why this is happening at that time. Uh, you have to remember that the East India Company, of course, is a fortified space. There's part of it is about military security, but it is also a place of workers. This is where the big textile manufacturing, the textile procurement was taking place. And Chennai at this time has a huge population, perhaps as big as New York. Um, it didn't have a million people, which is what London had. But we forget how, how populous and what a big city it was at this time. And much of that population were workers. They were spinners, they were dyers, washer people, they were service providers, um, servicing the like, company, but service merchant. Uh, they were cleaners, they were cooks, they were uh, housekeepers, uh, loaders. I mean, I can go on and on. Tank diggers. Uh, all of these people lived in the city. And as now, all of these people had been in my time being seen on maps. So many of the maps that I just showed you, if you don't actually don't, not all of them, but some of them, but many of them don't actually mark habitations. Special work. This one does. And in this one, this is a map from 1854, you get a real sense that you know the racial hierarchies of this segregated colonial city were also equally anchored in the hierarchies of caste. So if you look at this instead from this 1824 map, you see not only the creation of the two women as a proper winner. But you're also seeing um, the marking of caste. You can see the marking of how caste presses caste access to the, uh, to the, what that point called the native town, which is Georgetown. You can see that that access in Europe, just one point out. See this? You can see that the access is to a canal, right? And you can see it's opposite what, what, what they call the which is the now, the And there's a huge area of space separating the from, from the period, which is near the central history. Right? So, what you're seeing here, and the point is really to kind of really emphasize the degree to which this city has grown up as a segregated city, where there was caste and segregation in a way, mutually supporting each other. Okay. Now, we were interested in this map for, for the reason that we get a really good sense here of not just the economic life of oppressed castes, not just the economic life of the city, but it's also its connection with the water. But most interestingly, because this particular map was also used by Tadar, um, who was a very famous Kalunian sanitation engineer, to develop the drainage plan for the drainage of the city. So what you see below, what I have just aligned to you, is the use of this map um, by Tadar to then uh, imagine what is ideal sanitation system would look now, of course, a lot of people have written about Anna. In the papers, there's a long history of aging. It is a work. But what I want to draw your attention to here is that the same space, look how the main line of the sewer comes like this. And then how all the different lines of the sewer join this is a picture of the exactly opposite each other. Okay? 
So what you might, what you're sort of seeing as a kind of new development of a very city meaning, very much spatial segregation, and very much the management. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Aditya, who's going to take the remaining uh, slides. Okay. Um, so, like Bhavani said, uh, I'm Aditya. Uh, I'm also a historian, and I'm largely an environmental historian. And I was working on the Kaveri when I was in Chennai in 2015. A lot of my time is actually spent building Narmada, and the flood happened. And you know, this research into Kuwam was, we didn't actually plan for to do serious research into We were thinking about what are the various sites that really rescued Madras during the flood. And if you remember, you know, 2015, maybe some of you are too young. But many of the papers said that the overflow of the flood was actually stopped by the poor. So we said, let's try and investigate it. That's how we came to all of these multiple histories of the river. And what we started to then find, which I'll tell you a little bit more about using some other maps, is that actually the poem was, was called various different kinds of terms. As Bhavani said, it was sometimes it was very seasonal. Uh, people, for instance, called it a sheet of water. Um, for, sometimes they called it a swamp. But this consistent usage of river, we didn't really find. And I think that is what we were very interested in. So what I'm going to do now is to take you through another series of maps, mostly in the 20th century. But also I'll talk to you a little bit about the archive. Because one of the things that really puzzled us as historians was that it was very difficult to get any consistent information about the Kuwam. Right? Um, in other words, there was nobody writing about the river kind of consistently. Lots of people have written about it, like Talak wrote about it. Even the famous nurse, Florence Nightingale, very concerned about the Kuwam when she came to Madras. She said, you know, this is a really noxious, horrible water body. What are we going to do about it? So, you know, lots of people have written about it, but there was no consistent body of work saying that, oh, this is a river. This is a problem in the city. And suddenly though, in the 20th century, we found that the Guam started, many, many people started to talk about the Guam as a river. Okay, and so I'll try and give you some idea into why they started talking about the Guam as a river and what were the kinds of discussions that allowed people to talk about the Guam as a river. And what ways then did they talk about it as a river? And finally, how did they try and protect it then as, as a river. So this language really becomes consolidated and becomes solidified. And today it's become almost commonplace, right? Everybody is using this language largely. Let me start with this map. Okay, so this map is a Survey of India map. Um, it's an inset, again, like many of the maps that we've shown you. And I want to direct your attention to this particular arrow, right? Um, this is, you know, this... I don't want to get into the history of it, but there's something known as the trigonometric survey of India, where maps start, in the, which was in the early 20th century, maps start to become a lot more accurate. So there's a big difference that you see now between these 20th century maps and the maps that Bhavani earlier showed you, some of which were hand-drawn, as she said, right? So these are much more measured maps that are made now by an official body called the survey of India. I want to direct you to this arrow here, right? And what does this arrow say? It shows us the direction of flow of the Kuam. Okay? And okay, right here. Right? Um, so can you, I hope you can see this. So this moves in both directions. Okay. So the water of the Kuam, as the map indicates, is actually not moving in a singular direction like a river would. It's not flowing straight into the sea. But actually, it's moving, as this map seems to suggest, in multiple directions, right? So, the Survey of India map is quite interesting for that reason, at least. So, it's not behaving like a consistent water body, okay? Okay. 
Now, what is this map? This map is a slightly different map. So, if that is a Survey of India map, this is a map from the Public Works Department. Again, thank you to Armanal for allowing us, maybe for giving us the infrastructure to actually scan this map. Okay. So, this is a map of Madras, and it is a map that is devoted largely now to the Kuam, right? It's known as the Kuam Pumping Scheme map. So, until now, a lot of the maps that we've shown you are maps of Madras which also had the Kuam. This is the first map we've come across, which was the map of the Kuam itself, and Madras is incidental then to the Kuam. So, it changes the way that we see the map, and it changes the way that we see the city. And what was happening, so this map is between, between 1927. And what was happening in the 1920s is very interesting. So there was a huge concerted effort now to try and engineer the Kuomo. And many people started to weigh in because, you know, as Bhavani showed you, there were lots of residences now that were established around the Kuomo. Chintadri Pet becomes a very interesting neighborhood for lots of reasons. Lots of very affluent Europeans settle there. And they don't like the smell of the Kuomo. Now, even many uh, members of the newly elected Justice Party are now living on the banks of the Guam. No, none more famous than Tyagraya Chetty. And this is really the 1920s is almost a tale of famous men, but it's much more than that also. And so Tyagraya Chetty in the 1920s is really the force to say that we need to do something about this river. It's become a problem within the city. And how do we try and engineer the river? So he gets together the Madras Corporation the Madras government itself, and he gets to the Public Works Department, which is starting to become a very powerful organization because they have the engineering and, skill and skills and expertise. And he says, let's constitute a com committee. And he somehow manages to get all of these three bodies. And all of these three bodies don't like each other because they all have to pay for things. And they don't usually, you know, they don't usually come together. So actually, it's a big effort to get them on the table. Because one fellow, one body will say, oh, you know, I don't want to pay for this. The next what, uh, department will say, I don't want to pay for this. It's always warring usually. But Tyagraya Chetty actually manages to get them all into a table and say, let's talk about this seriously. Right? And he finds um, an engineer to carry out some of the, uh, what he wants to do uh, around the Kuam to try and clean it and to make it into a flowing river. Right? Um, and the engineer is another famous person called W.G. Bristow. Um, and Bristow, um, many, many roads, uh, the part of the harbor, everything is named largely after Bristow. So Bristow is in Madras at this point, and he's working for the Public Works Department. And his idea is to really try and engineer the Kuam into a tidal river, right? And Bhavani told you earlier that this is both a seasonal water body at times. It's been characterized as a seasonal water body. It's also intertidal in, in some parts, in some ways, depending on the map that you see. But for Bristow now, he says that the only way to clean the river, and he's very, very positive, right? He comes with a lot of energy, a lot of spirit. And he tells Tyagaraya Chetty that this is actually a very easy engineering problem that we can resolve within the next five years or so. And he says, no problem. And I will do it. So he thought that this was a pro the Kuam was an engineering problem that would easily be solved. And so he tries to do some interesting things uh, using this pumping scheme. Okay. So he does two or three things. One is he introduces a canal from the harbor, right? The harbor now has um, salt water that's flowing into it. He uses a canal into the harbor and then he connects that canal into the Kuam and he tries to bring water from the sea into the Kuam which he hopes will send water back again into the sea. But his two main interventions, one is that he's one of the first people to put a dredger. Um, now, you see the mouth of the comb here? So, he puts a dredger there and he says, the problem is accumulation of sand. Now, many of you will know this, right? So, the sand doesn't allow the river to flow. It stops the river from flowing. So, it's the accumulation of sand, which is part of the problem. So, he puts a dredger okay, to remove the sand. That's one part of the scheme that he attempts. The second part of the scheme is to obviously raise the water level. So he starts to pump water again from near the harbor all the way into the Kuam. Okay. So he takes that water from near the harbor. This is sea water. He pumps it into the Kuam, into the mouth of the Kuam, hoping that he can raise the water level of the Kuam. And therefore, he's removing sand on the one hand. He's also raising the water level of the Kuam. And so the water should then flow into the sea. Right. And now he calls, this is not an effort that he's doing alone. So in the early decades of the 20th century, 
many urban governments are now investing in this idea of oh we should make these water bodies into tidy rivers so bristow is one amongst many engineers so he is reading a lot of um, engineering you know pamphlets material from all around the world and which is why he has this idea that we can actually make or remake the kuwa into a tidy river okay so this scheme runs for around 5 years or so by this time bristow is no longer he becomes you know partially known for the scheme because it seems to be working initially but within 5 years he is left for kochi and kochi and that's where he makes his name as an engineer but by 1930 um something changes okay so by 1930 this scheme stops working so uh, there's a review after 5 years and this is how we follow the river some it's somehow in the archive right so you know the scheme was a big moment when actually we could focus on the river and 5 years later in the public works department again we found archival files where the scheme was being reviewed and in this review something very interesting happens so remember i told you that there was a lot of enthusiasm Bristow thought that he could resolve this problem. Jagraj Chetty managed to bring together three very, very um, bod- three bodies that had a lot of animosity towards each other. In 1930s, the new engineer, the PWD engineer, who's designated to the scheme, says that the bad and I quote here. I'll just read a little bit. He says that the bad odor of the kuam is really attributable to the fact that the berms and the bed of the kuam. are used as latrines by the vagrants and poor people of chintadri gray okay so you see a shift in the pwd files okay, so initially there's a lot of enthusiasm that something can be done is easily resolvable generic problem but very quickly within 5 years in the review of the scheme the onus for actually the poem not flowing is put on to the urban poor of madras city so this is which happens within the span of just 5 or 6 years where engineering seems to meet its limits with the poor right and this new engineer gives a new series of suggestions instead of the pumping scheme he says okay you know what we can try and pump the water but really this is not a problem of engineering it's a different social problem and he says let's try and put up a boundary wall along the river especially the sides facing chintadri gray he also says that the sides of the river should be steep and made inaccessible so it should be embanked but we should make the river inaccessible to people then he says that all the huts situated along the banks of the river should be removed and he says firewood lime shell depots rice depots all of these need to be removed right so you see that shift now he's a pwd engineer he's, he doesn't really know much about the social geography of the river but nevertheless he's claiming that okay this is known we can't do anything about it in terms of engineering let's now shift the discussion to the social as a social problem the river is a social problem right so maps are some of what we showed you so we'll end with a few Uh, images and pictures from the archive and see and bhavani has already shown you how you can read some of these pictures and images and we'll show you now how you can read the river through different kinds of archives so so far i gave you a sense of the engineering archive right but how do we know actually how the people along the banks of the kuwa lived why were they there in the first place they didn't appear from nowhere right so this is the second line of investigation that we tried to pursue which is a difficult line to understand you know because the river becomes a problem for many wealthy residents as i told you in chintadri pet then it's very easy that oh okay you, this problem needs to be resolved so very powerful pwd engineers then give you engineering scheme so it's easier to track that the life of the people who are living along the banks of the river is slightly harder to track to understand how they came to be there why they came to be there and so what we will try and suggest in this talk is that the kuwam worked in two ways that in many ways its banks served as a refuge to many communities who settled there who actually made the city work in many kinds of ways remember i told you about the flood at you know that the kuwam might the flowing kuwam might have saved madras city but its working population as well people who settled there through different um, through different waves of settlement also worked for the city um, and also had a stake in the city in many ways right 
Um, and let me just briefly point to some of these images that give us some hints, right? So these two images, the first images that you see are from the public health archive of Madras. This is another very interesting place to get a lot of information about the Kuang because typically, again, you know, there are mosquitoes that are breeding along the banks of Kuang. So health officials are very interested in the Kuang as a space. So they write a lot about the Kuang. But they also write then about the people of the Kuang because they see them fundamentally as carriers of disease in one way or the other. But we then, if you reread these archives, or you twist these archives, you start to get some information in about the lives of people who lived on the banks of the river. Okay, but let's just look at these images very briefly. One, the second image, if you look at it, the caption is very clear. It says, view of the discharge pipe from the septic tank and Kuang at Chetpet. And if you look at this with the sewage map, it's very easily mappable. Okay, so the sewage map shows you all those red lines that you saw. Let's go back. All these red lines, these blue lines are all sewage inlets. And this is an image that shows you pretty much the same thing. But in the background of this image, you see something slightly different. You see, oh yeah, let me just point out. In the background of this image here, you see a settlement. Um, this is a house. Um, it's, we don't know exactly whose house it is. But nevertheless, it, it looks like a structure that has been built in, that's been lived, lived in. Um, and people seem to habit the banks of the Kuomo. Quite consistently, as Bhavani told you, the first wave of settlers were weavers in Chittadri Bay. So many, many people who, and th that was part of the city's thriving economy um, during the early 1800s. The next image that you see, uh, this is a bridge, and again, this is off the river Kuan, is oops. Um, what you can see here is an animal now, which is using. which is using the river uh, to um, to drink water from. Um, and there's a man who obviously has some interest in this animal. So you see an economic life of the river also that's appearing through some of these images. Although this image again is clearly indicating the um, infrastructural prowess of the tram that had just come into Madras in the 20th century, right? So this is from the railway archive. But you get something in the background that indicates something slightly different. But this is part of a much longer story. And I'll just give you some hints into this story before I wrap up. So in the 19th century, we all know that the Buckingham Canal was built. And actually, what we started to find out, and this is through the legal archive, we found out that in the 19th century, in the 1870s onwards, many rice grain traders and firewood traders started to settle along the banks of the Guam. And they didn't settle there arbitrarily. It was actually the colonial government, the Madras uh, Corporation, which invited them to come and settle in these areas because the city needed firewood and then it needed rice. Because remember, between 1870 to around 1900 were years of severe famine in the city. Okay? And which is why the Buckingham Canal is actually built, built to bring rice all the way from Nellore into Madras city. Right? Um, so many of these need, many of these traders who come from uh, uh, Andhra uh, through the Buckingham Canal, what is today Andhra, needed depots. And so some of the first settlers along the banks of the Kua were actually people who set up firewood depots and who set up rice depots and who became rice merchants. And they were all invited by the government because it was a crucial part of how the city was running. Okay. Now, I'm going to finish almost with this map. Um, now, what you see, this is a 1947 map from the Royal Geographical Society. It's a very, very detailed map, right? Um, and now, what you start to see is that some of these settlements of people along the banks of the Kuang start to become visible, right? And this is a Chintadri Pet area. You see housing here that's clearly demarcated. And what we were interested in is a neighborhood called um, Cox Chiri, which, which is, is very, very, uh, it's sort of iconic because it's one of the first, you know, the Chennai Improvement Trust also builds one of its first housing projects in the area. But this is an area that you start to get a lot of information about. Right? Um, and these are health inspectors who are going into this region, um, for example. But the other archive that we found as well was of social scientists. 
Okay. So there are, okay. And this map is interesting for other reasons as well, where you get a lot of detail. I'm just giving you one example here. There's another example here. So you get these sites of oppressed castes that are marked out in these maps much more clearly. They become, they become far more visible um, even within the mapping structure. So clearly something is changing in terms of land politics. Something is changing in terms of how people are laying claim to space. So all of this is then what we need to track in the archive. So I'll just end with a couple of examples of how you actually find out about the lives of the people who live on the banks of the Buang. So for instance, one of them um, says that, and this was an investigation in the 1920s, what we found another useful site was social science journals. So actually many people went and did investigations and we found one particular very detailed article, for instance, on people who are living on the banks of the Guam, right? The Guam is one of the most convenient places to stay in the city of Madras and to settle because it's almost a natural train. However, the problem is that people keep being invited to settle on the banks of the Guam, but they're never, reg they're never regularized, right? The Madras government always used this, the corporation also, used the system of leases. So it used to say, okay, come for 10 years, come for 15 years. But people would settle, they would put their houses there. But then they would be asked to leave suddenly because the lease would expire in 10 years, 15 years, which is why then you get insights through the legal archive, right? So many people who lived in these settlements um, in Chintadri Pet, right along the banks of the Guam, um, in one of the investigations we found were a, a complete mix of people. So there were lots of Muslims, there were, lot, there were Roman Catholics who lived there, there were Hindu communities, uh, members of the Hindu community who lived there. Um, so you see a real mix and you see a real diversity of professions as Bhavani said. So there were washermen, there was, for instance, um, some uh, a person who worked at one of the most famous billiard houses in Madras. Um, there were people who serviced the city in different kinds of ways. So you get these, you start to get these insights into people's lives who lived on the banks of the Guam. So this is an image that I will end with, and this is an image of firewood. And this firewood again, this is a, um, you know you can find this image quite easily past India. But during the famines, for instance, the Guam was absolutely central and these depots were absolutely central in rescuing the city because people had to cook using firewood in some way or the other, right? So which is why so many of these depots were then set, uh, settled along the banks of the Guam. But it's through these images, it's through these fragments of the archive, sometimes more detailed, sometimes just flashes and fragments, that we start to get a sense of the working river and the life of working people who are living alongside. So we come back to this image of the river in the city, and I'm just going to briefly sum up the two things that we told you. One is that maybe this was not necessarily always um, a river in the traditional sense that it flows into the sea, that we found a lot of evidence to suggest that it was a heavily seasonal water body. There's also an intertidal water body in spaces, but not in other spaces. And the maps reveal the changing nature of how the Kuam has shifted over the years and how the spaces of the Kuam have been depicted over the years. That's one thing. And the other thing that we told you is that the river partially worked for the city, but also people who settled along the banks of the Kuam also worked for the city and were part of the working life of the city, at least in three waves, one of which was weavers. The other was firewood um, merchants and rice merchants. And the third was people who serviced the city in many different kinds of ways, including some who worked in, in, in very, very important professions like healthcare and um, entertainment and so on. But I think I will stop there. And Bhavani, do you want to add something at this point? I think what we want to just show you in a sense is kind of where we are at in investigation and search. And uh, we would welcome questions and clarification, comments, uh, you know, things that we have missed, things that might be uh, maybe jumping into your mind, the women, the law association with it. But, but I, I think, think why we decided to do this, and uh, I, 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 I think somewhat strongly about this, is that I think history is not a true story. Right? History is 
we we are so invested in figuring out okay, okay, what happened, and then we try and then have a very defined sense of the class. So to do that, for us, actually speaking to the room in some way was the opposite, which was a sense of intimidation and opinion. And uh, we really hope that uh, you take that in that spirit and sort of bring your imagination. Uh, so that's it. That's true. So, so the world has um, its origins in the the third one of the West, uh, in the Western England, there were no deserts. Yeah, and the thing is that even there we see it's a highly seasonal entity. Very seasonal. Very seasonal. What are the changes it traverses through? I haven't looked, we haven't looked into the rural aspects. We really mostly the archive that we started is within the municipal Thank you. I see someone is a wonderful presentation. And uh, what I like about what I like about the association is like the way you brought in the pre 19th century maps. Uh, the maps are still. Uh, it's not technocratic in nature, so the post 19th century maps, well, it's kind of a diplomatic approach, and uh, like Adil they were saying, it's kind of a, a solidified, uh, which is not, which is always not the case with uh, the pre 19th century. So, my concern and question would be like, uh, so when it comes to particularly map making, map making, uh, it is a powerful activity where uh, you are dealing with a lot of uh, power in hand. For example, uh, particularly when you are making a map with respect to the natural resources, it comes to the flow of a river. Uh, particularly here in this case, it's a seasonal river. Flux and the dynamics of the river is very difficult to capture. The so, uh, uh, my concern is. Um, it's like, like if that is the case, uh, then studying the history of uh, something like a river body or, or like a pasture uh, or a normal uh, 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 places where uh, people have been interacting with that and taking part in making and making of a particular space. In this case, the making and making of, like you said, cool, uh, accessible. Uh, how do we look at it? I can see, uh, uh, like, you have done it in some parts where you have captured uh, some of the post 19th century, uh, around 1930s, where you can see the books. And uh, uh, my question is that, like, how do we capture the dynamics of a river? But it becomes easy when it comes to a social science study and a lot of people. But when it comes to a historical analysis, how do, how, how do you take, in, uh, take into account the dynamics of the river? Because there's a very 19th century map where you can see the, the mouth has not been used. Uh, but also I'm, I'm concerned about like which month it could have been because it's a seasonal river. So it could have been, I was trying to notice that they, 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 there was no month in that time. Hello? One more point. Excuse me, that's uh, let her finish this. Yeah. No. Can you see, sir? Uh, Can I ask after? Sure. Okay. 